Wayfeather Media presents Claire Voyaging. Hey, yo. Welly, welly, welly. Well, here we are again. What do you know? <laughs> um, Frank. Uh huh. I want to tell you something. Please do. We have some new Claire Voyagers. Do we? What does that wait? What does that mean? <laughs> I thought you'd never ask. <laughs> they are uh, supporters of our show. Supporters. Yeah, they Pe- went to buymeacoffee.com dot com and they said, "I want to support Claire Voyaging." So thank you to anonymous. <laughs> they didn't put their name. And Michael. Wow, I. I want to thank Anonymous more. I think we should. We don't talk about Anonymous <laughs> enough. Yeah, someone just they didn't want us to name them, but that's okay. That's fine. Thank you guys so much. That's awesome. Yeah. Um. So that's exciting. And if you if you like what we do, then hop on over to buymeacoffee.com dot com slash clairvoyaging. Oh, and what what have we been making? Merch. That's right. Frankie is making merch. We made designs. some merch. That'll be up in our. We redid our website a little bit, so we'll have some new. What, what are we making? I just I've been making the designs. I don't know what we're actually. There's some coffee on. mugs, and they. One of them is very funny. I I want it. Is, are we only it's doing a coffee guy, mugs? It's a ship captain. He's like looking out into the distance with binoculars, and then behind him is a ghost, like peeping out. I mean, not the ghost, a a skeleton. Is it, it, it's only coffee mugs? We're not doing I don't any, know. Can we do like t-shirts too or something? We can do it all. all we right. can do it all. There's going to be stuff. Hey, Lauren. Yeah. Guess why today is a special day? Why? Because we have our first guest interview. Yes. And it's with the famous, the lovely Carolyn Swift Jones. Carolyn Swift Jones practices and teaches divine mediumship. Uh, full disclosure, we already had the interview with her, so you're going to hear a recording that we just finished. <laughs> but my goodness, what a pleasant lady. What a, a smart lady. She knows how to put things into terms that are so approachable and understandable. And I had an absolute blast talking to her. Yeah. How, about, how about you? She's she's amazing. I actually had a session with her a year ago. And that's kind of why we were like, let's bring her on. Um, and I, I still think about things that she told me all that time ago, we all st- that year ago. We still talk about it. Yeah. All that year ago. So she is very cool. This is going to be a two-parter. So you're welcome. Here we go. Welcome to Claire Voyaging, Carolyn Swift Jones. Hi, everybody. And thank you for having me on your show. Can you introduce yourself? Just tell us uh, a little bit about yourself and when you first realized that you have this, however you would call it. (laughs) We just learned that we don't like to call it gifts. You don't like to call it gifts so that you have this intuitive quality. Okay. Thank you for for, um, diverting yourself around the word gift. (laughs) Um, I always knew that I was multidimensional uh, from when I was a little girl. Um, I had experiences of kind of popping out of my body and seeing myself from behind and being a little bit flabbergasted that I knew I was a huge um, genderless being and I didn't understand what I was doing in that little girl's body. And I also, as a as a small child, was always seeing what I called fairies in the sky. They were just little pinpoints of light everywhere. And I also had the experience of being visited by a being that I called the lady dressed in light because I didn't know else how, how to call her, but she was a beautiful uh, ascendant master, I have since learned. And uh, she came and put her hand over me often. So all of that was going on, but I didn't have the vocabulary to call it intuition. And as I've said, I I believe we're all born with uh, the ability to be intuitive. It's just a matter of 
are we willing to practice it? And do we have the tools to practice? Later on in my life, um, I had already embarked on a career of the theater and I was uh, moving along my jolly way and I was pretty sure that that's what I wanted to be, was an actor. And I found that when I was backstage, I naturally wanted to use my hands in a healing modality on other actors or technicians or stage managers who might be in need of some help. It was just something I did when I was backstage. And then one thing led to another and I didn't have any training. It was the kind of Reiki, but with no training, I suddenly had developed a healing practice and suddenly had people coming to my house and all of a sudden found myself working with someone who had ovarian cancer And I worked with that woman, no training, just instinct, and the cancer went away. Wow. So then my name was on the map, and suddenly people are coming, which I wasn't ready for. I was was young. I was 27, I guess. Well, one woman was brought to me who only had a couple weeks left to live, and I didn't know why, what I could do for her. But as I put my hand over her, I suddenly was aware of somebody walking in who insisted that I tell her he was there, insisted. And I thought, I can't do this. I have no ability to do this. And this being, who turned out to be her dad, was pressing in so hard that I started to sweat. And this dear woman said, what's the matter, honey? You look like you're about to throw up. Oh, my God. (laughs) And so I finally said, there's a guy here. And I described him to her and she, she shot up and she said, daddy. And, uh, she left knowing that when she crossed over that he would be right there with her. So that was the beginning of my knowing that as I had been practicing one form of intuition, healing. I believe healing and mediumship are the same. It is the practice of oneness, which is what healing is. We're practicing oneness as healers, and we practice oneness as mediums. Um, So I had been practicing, but in a different way. And then this other door opened. And then I became more interested in um, serving not just the physical body, but what I would, what I now call the soul topography of somebody that I'm working with. So the whole terrain, uh, the emotional landscape, um, the family and spirit that surrounds them on either side, the tribes of being, past lives, of course, are there, ascendant masters are there angelic energies are there the animal spirits are there all of it and that became my life's work uh, to just move forward i now call it divine mediumship because i'm interested in serving from the wholeness of being and not just for uncle frank who may be wanting to come in and speak because It's lovely when Uncle Frank comes in and has something to say, but there's so much more to us than our loved ones who have crossed over. There's so much more. That's what I'm interested in serving, is getting to the hem of the garment that allows the person that I'm serving to feel into their wholeness in what I call their poem. Because each person is an individual poem with layers and layers and layers of meaning. The story about the father coming through like made me choked up for a second. That's so beautiful. Um, But also that like the soul topography and the, the poem, that's such a beautiful way of looking at it. We're coming from a place of like two non psychics that have like a deep interest in expanding our spiritual journey. We're still learning. We're trying to keep the gatekeeping out and like 
we're trying to destigmatize. So our our niece has developed psychic abilities and and she's six. In speaking with her parents, we're like realizing that, oh man, this is something that she might not be able to talk openly about at school, even though it's something that's very real to her. And that's suddenly having a lot of big kid emotions that she has to get through maybe a little faster, mature a little quicker. A big demographic for us in this is the non-psychic parents of psychic kids to get them comfortable, give them the, t- the tools to help uh, manage and develop their kids and make sure that they grow up to be balanced. A lot of emotional struggle can come along with that. Oh, that's such a good mission. I really appreciate that. And I appreciate you, you using the word normalizing um, because that's my mission too. That's awesome. I'm really, really, um, I'm allergic to any conversation around intuition or mediumship that suggests that there's a hierarchy involved or that you have to be special. And I, when I teach it, I ask my students to let go of the word gifted. Oh, this is good to know. <laughs> yeah, that's great. <laughs> I ask, I say, we're, we're just not even going to use the word. We'll use practiced. Practiced. Oh, I love that. Because I believe everybody is born as an intuitive being in that we all have a connection to the oneness. And the oneness is where the waves of intuition are generated from. They generated from our divine oneness, our divine connection. So we all have it. It's just that some of us practice it. Right. It's like. We are all given a violin. Are we going to pick it up and practice? Well, it depends on a lot of factors. And with children, it depends on their heart space. It depends on how compatible they are with a vast array of differing personalities. It depends on how compassionate they are. It depends on lots of these things. Um, but I, I I'm on a mission to make sure that we drop the artificial need to make or create or put a medium on a pedestal. We are all multidimensional. We're born with three dimensional consciousness of um, the the school of planet Earth. And we're also born with fourth dimensional consciousness because we just came from that seamless, timeless, everlasting oneness, that connection that is that place of uh, continuity between all of us. So when we're practicing our intuition, another way I teach it is to say we're practicing oneness. We're practicing divine knowing that we're one. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. that's a lot of sense. Yeah, yeah, that's great. I love that. Um, can can I? You, oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead, Uncle Frank. Sorry. <laughs> 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 the um, okay, so there's a couple of just because you know we're 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 trying to ease people into all this. There's a couple of definitions I'd like to get from you. Just some terminology you used, just for some clarification. So the first thing I want to talk about is you, you've referred to ascendant masters. For anybody who doesn't know what that might be, uh, how would you define it? An ascendant master is an energy that uh, I believe correlates to our ascendancy. The most commonly known ascendant masters are Buddha and Jesus and Kuan Yin, um, et cetera. Are those um, the same as like enlightened beings? Enlightened beings, yes. Okay, because yeah. I've heard those two things and I never knew if they were the same or not. <laughs> well, and we are all enlightened beings. Another Another uh, mission of mine is to make sure that uh, we don't say to one another this phrase, which is, when you're as enlightened as I am, you'll understand. Mm. Mm. <laughs> I don't think that, that <laughs> yeah, my, in my classes, I, I say we're not going to say that because I don't believe there's any hierarchy in our divinity. I believe we're fully human and fully divine, and there's no 
hierarchy in our divinity. But what my experience has been is that an ascendant master is never an exterior being, but rather a reflection of an inner being that we have yet to meet, a part of ourselves that we have yet to meet. So just so for clarification for me that, you know, if we're operating on the concept that we're all like a self-identifying piece of the same puzzle, how many ascendant masters are there or is it infinite? I would say infinite. Yeah. I would say always evolving and always expanding. I may I share with you something that happened Please. years ago with an ascendant master we know as Jesus. Um, so when I was a young, like a teenager, I was a born again Christian and I was a devoted born again Christian. And I was madly in love with Jesus and very, I thought, very close with that energy. And then I got older. Things went on in my life. And 20 years went by and I was a 40 year old woman sitting in my apartment in, in New Jersey, trying to connect with Jesus. And I heard myself saying out loud, you know, Jesus, I used to be so close to you, but I don't know how to do that anymore because I've evolved. And clear as a bell, I could hear him say, well, I've evolved, too. Are you the only one that's allowed to evolve? <laughs> and. In that instant, I got it. There's no such thing as a static being. There is an always evolving relationship of divinity to divinity. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Something that we've been <laughs> looking into a lot lately or, or have been made privy to is how once you pass away, you're not done. There's still a lot to do. And that's yes. been, that's been kind of a, a quite the revelation to learn that you know um, some other uh, psychic mediums that we've spoken to have have talked about how uh, Lauren's brother Ian is still around and still learning and and growing and developing even in his spirituality and his personality and that's been it's really cool because we tend to think of somebody like oh you know they only lived to because her brother passed away when he was twenty five twenty five twenty six twenty six it's funny like everyone thinks oh he only lived to twenty six and it's like well no he stopped being here at twenty six but there's still a lot going on like we're we're still working towards the thing we were working towards in the first place so, oh yeah uh, and I've told people that I actually feel more connected to him now just because I'm working on going not only inward, but also just understanding the oneness that you're talking about. And because of that, I've become more connected to my brother and like paying attention to signs or messages that he's given me. And you also told me in a reading that I had with you last year that he kind of acts as like my cartographer and wants to go with us on trips and like he didn't get to travel that much when he was alive. So um, we, you know, just kind of the idea of him has evolved in the 19 mm -hmm. years that he's been gone. I never got to meet him when he was alive, but since he's passed, it's been, I feel like I have a friend that I've never met in the flesh, but it doesn't really matter. Uh, we, yeah. we we treat him like a roommate, you know, he's around when uh he... It's very fun. And like we tell our kids about him and our daughter asks about him and we kind of say like, he's here, he's protecting you, you know, and you never got to meet him, but he knows you and you can know him. Yeah, this has helped our idea of the bigger oneness, as you call it, so which much, I love. So much more, so much bigger and more interesting than I assumed in my tiny little Uncle Frank brain. <laughs> oh, Uncle Frank. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. And that's part of everybody's individual poem, actually. Yeah. Is the ongoing growth of family and loved ones in fourth dimension as our family and loved ones continue to grow. Of course, we're growing with them because we're in the classroom with them. And it's so we have this beautiful uh, a buddy system, a community system that is really. Um, incredible, so inspiring, and so hopeful. It's a beautiful, beautiful tapestry when you when you can see it. And I'm so glad for you guys that you are. That's beautiful. 
Yay. Thank you. Yeah, it's helped um, just in like my grief journey and also my spiritual journey to, I guess, you know, when you think about the things that you've had to process over your life, how do you share that wisdom with other people? Some of it has been helping friends who have lost someone close to them and saying like, just know as hard as it is to hear, they're always with you. Like they're always with you. And like you will understand that as you go through like the grief process. Very good. I think it's also important to remember that even Jesus wept. Mourning is its own way of communing. Yeah. Mourning is its own way of being in what I would call a state of deep mediumship communication mm -hmm. with the one that we have just lost. And it's our time in mourning to say, this is how much I love you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. With that said, would you say uh, having an understanding of all this and the oneness of things is more makes grieving easier? Because I know there's ways to grieve in an unhealthy way. I think it is it's case by case. It's unique to every individual soul. I always encourage my clients to let their grieving go on as long as their body tells them. Because mm. our bodies will tell us how long we need. Mm. Um, you know, it's like losing a layer of our skin and our bodies will tell us. Um, and there are beautiful traditions in different religions. In Judaism, there are very specific ideas about how long mourning lasts right. and what a family should and should not do. Hmm. And a family should not be asked to engage in conversation after they've lost a loved one, for instance. There, there are different systems of mourning. But I think it's our physical bodies will tell us. Um, and also, um, our loved ones will tell us, you know, I'm ready. Yeah. I'm ready. I do like that because the I know that sometimes there's a pressure to like maybe get through the grief quickly. And that can be so damaging, as I'm sure you yeah. know more than I do. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I've seen it damage people yeah. uh, over and over and over. And it, it to me, uh, there's a lack of compassion there um, that I think it's important that we notice. The cheer up, get over it. Um, life is short. And the basic ignorance around mourning as a spiritual practice, because as you say, Ian is still He's healing. He's evolving, as are we all. And the more we can be present to each other's vulnerable woundedness and just be there for each other, the more we can help each other evolve. Uh, yeah, that's such a difficult thing for people to just be in to be in it or be in it with yeah. someone else. It's so uncomfortable for people sometimes. And I haven't thought about the concept of, of Ian still healing himself. I wonder if there's anything we should do to ask Ian what he needs. Uh, we poured him a shot of tequila on his birthday. Maybe that wasn't <laughs> helpful. I don't know. <laughs> we were it like, come fun. hang out with us. Yeah. <laughs> we got some you know scratcher tickets. <laughs> I hear Ian saying, well, aren't you guys still healing? Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's a it's an ongoing process. I just I just learned uh, Reiki a couple of weeks ago and I'm it, it like triggered more healing for me. And I'm like, I still have some stuff to do. I have some healing to do. And I feel yeah. like it's yeah, it's a constant ongoing process of shedding your trauma and shedding your the stories and all the things that you're kind of carrying with you. So mm -hmm. yes, Ian, we are still healing. <laughs> and so am I. Yeah. And so, right. yeah. And so are we all. Yeah. So you, you've mentioned like Christianity and Christian belief uh, quite a bit so far. There's so much fear surrounding. Um, mm. Give me, give me the right vocabulary. The one like practical oneness, <laughs> the practical oneness. Sure. Yeah. And you know, I've been, 
in circles where someone would consider the oneness to be evil, right? I want to see what you have to say to, to anybody who might fear this and if there's anything that can help them get through that. Oh, sure. Um, well, first of all, I believe that uh, Jesus was an incredible medium and intuitive, a great healer. The unfortunate thing about the way Christianity has been taught over the centuries, it has created a dividing line in the universe between good and bad. And if you study the words of Jesus and if you listen to them in Aramaic, there is no dividing line, but there is a continuum. And I'll give you an example. The Aramaic word for evil, which is bisha, it means evil on one hand, and it also means unripe. So it suggests something that is ripening into goodness, part of the continuum. The problem with dividing the universe into two parts is that it creates a superstitious belief that the part over here that we call bad, because it's separate from us, is going to do us harm. So we've created this kind of devil. Yeah. Interacting with that type of person might not be what you need for where you're at, but that doesn't make them bad. Is that correct? Is and that, okay. <laughs> yes. And there's also, I think that some of the fear and paranoia has a practical basis in that there are people out there who do this simply for commercial effect, mm. simply to draw audience, simply to make money. Uh, there are charlatans out yeah. there, in other yeah. words, who are driven by ego. Ego. <laughs> and that, in that case, you know, that what those what the what people are saying, well, then what they're describing, I think there is some justification there. We need to be careful about working with people who would like to represent to us what their ego is telling us they must represent to us in order to be famous or to make money or to draw a crowd. Or to be right or something. Yeah. Or to be right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I do a lot of work with my ego. A lot of work. I mean, doesn't everybody need to do that? <laughs> but when I teach, I ask my students to consider that their ego might be like pizza dough and that they can pick it up like this and they can pull it and stretch it and that it's actually very pliant and maybe you even can spin it around like this <laughs> <laughs> the ego is something we have created and it's pliant and it's plastic and we can stretch it and soften it that again, there's practice, practice, practice. Let me ask a question on that because I'm not clear on this myself. Is ego, is it always a, a distraction or is ego ever a tool? Oh, I think it is both and. Hmm. Um, it's absolutely a tool when you're driving. Oh, sure. You need to have your ego. You need to have, ego is another word for third dimensional consciousness. Um. Another word for being aware of um, where do where do I exist in space? Uh, and is that a lion ahead on the path or is that a friend ahead on the path? So, yeah, ego is definitely can be a helpful tool where it gets in the way is when it, be, it we can hear our egos tell us that we are better than or that we are somehow special if you ever hear that phrase coming out when you're as enlightened as i am you'll understand that's ego talking because um someone who has truly digested the knowing that we are all one does not consider themselves to be more enlightened or less enlightened than anyone. So it has to do with 
I got something special and you're not. I'm Chevy Chase and you're not. Do you remember that? <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. So it seems like like your sense of ego, your sense of, of self is great when you're practicing self-awareness, not great once you let that self-awareness develop an opinion about how special you are. Yes. Okay. Beautifully special. Oh, Uncle Frank. <laughs> you have to write that down. Uncle that Frank for the win. That is great. <laughs> the ego, you know, a useful tool that I can now stretch from my being. Uh, and I'm going to be very loving and compassionate with it. I'm not going to ask it to go sit over there in the chair and behave. Right. We just want to be careful with with um, old separation language. Yeah. Uh, that lives on from old dogmas, because as mediums, um, I know that I, I, if I'm going to serve you, I need to serve myself as a full, whole human being. That means I love my ego. I love my personality. I get that I created my personality. Yeah. I get it. And I get that it's fluid. That way I can serve you. That way I'm ready to say, oh, you've done such an interesting job creating your personality. Oh, what will you do next? I that's see. so yeah, helpful that's great. Yeah, that, because I never was like a practicing Buddhist, but it taught me how to meditate and all that stuff. And I learned the concept of duality and um, I, I loved it. It was awesome until I had to engage in real life and like have real friends. And, and it was like, well, how do I be a a spiritual being and then also uh, go to work. And, and what you just explained that, that sense of separation, I had to reintegrate, but it, I, I felt a little guilty initially because I was like, I feel like I'm not like engaging fully in the lesson that is in, in the meditation and in, in the, the realm that I'm trying to explore more. What you're saying is that like you, if I understand you correctly, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but that you have to integrate in order to have the full experience. Yes. Integration is why we're here. Integration, incarnation. That's why we're here. Um, accepting this beautiful um, truth that we're fully human. And so that part in our humanness, we're always changing. It's fluid. We're always changing and fully light, fully divine. And that aspect of us, that full divinity is shared in common with everyone and everything. That's where compassion comes from. Mm. Yeah. Compassion for ourselves as the human aspect of the personality, the body aspect, which is beautiful and fluid and always changing. I was going to ask you how it comes through for you. If, if but, Yeah. Yeah, it comes, uh, well, coming through. I'm going to say coming as uh, I usually hear information like this, pulse, pulse, rest, pulse, pulse, rest. There's a there's a rhythm to it. Pulse, pulse, rest. It comes as a result of the uh, compassionate cooperation between two light beings. Uh, for instance, if I were uh, if I were having a session with you, Uncle Frank, we would be together um, with the agreement that I would be hearing from you. You would be showing me your soul topography and you would be saying like periscope down and I'm going to invite you in. And I would be basically reading to you from your Akashic records, but only because you were showing them to me. Uh, Akashic records. Can we get a layperson's definition of that? Oh, sure. The record of everything. <laughs> the record of um, the remembrance in energy, in energy, shape and tone, the sound, the light, the vibration of everything ever spoken, ever felt, ever expressed. Every journey ever taken, every book ever ever read, every battle ever fought, every marriage ever conceived, et cetera, et cetera. So it is the universe's enveloping impression of all the energy thus created. So I believe that a medium does not receive energy from out here. I believe that mediumship is cooperative when I teach it. 
and I've got my students practicing with each other, I always say to the person who is receiving the session or the reading or whatever, I say, thank you for all the information you gave so-and-so. Thank you for making yourself available because I believe it's cooperative. It makes me think of <laughs> Uncle Frank here. Mm-hmm. <laughs> We've in like another episode, we were talking about like things that we want to develop or things that we've had experience with or whatever. And I think we touched on like a hesitance that you have for being read. I I once was read in a way that I wasn't prepared for whatsoever. I didn't know it was going to happen and it felt invasive. I I had no idea what was going on. So I'm I'm in in a phase of like getting ready to do it again. I'm just, uh, yeah, I'm working. I'm I'm getting there. But so do you ever have, uh, a session with someone who has obviously paid for the session and given their permission, but you're sensing hesitance or is it always just like free flowing information coming through? No, hesitance is, is often there. And I have also received invasive readings in my life. So I know how they feel and I'm, I'm pretty um, touchy about that. Mm. Um, And so, uh, When I begin meditation on somebody, I begin um, by not conversing with them directly, but conversing with their guiding circle. Mm. Like, what is their collective agreement about what this person um, needs to hear now for their highest and best? It comes back to the golden rule over and over. That doing unto others as we would have done to ourselves. When I've received a reading that I felt was invasive, I thought, oh, my gosh, that person has no love for themselves. Otherwise, they would not have been so rude uh, to my being. Mediumship 101 is you always ask permission. You never give a reading unsolicited. Uh, When people come to me as a client, the permission has been given because they paid me. So I know I do have permission. But this whole idea of walking up to strangers on the street and saying Aunt Edna is here is metaphysical malpractice. Um, It's um, it's a trespass. And it's again, it's ego on display and not um, oneness on display. Right. As long as the commandment of love is being followed, these things don't happen. As long as we're always thinking, how is this landing in the ear of the listener? You know, right. Does this feel like love to the ear of the listener or does this feel like commerce? Right. Yeah. Do you, as you're just like going about your day, receive information when you're talking to someone at the grocery store or does it not work that way for you do you have the on and off switch that we've heard some people talk about i do and very rarely will it come on without my expecting it Mm. very rarely uh once in the dentist chair uh, with my (laughs) dental dentist i suddenly was aware of her grandmother oh wow I suddenly was, and she was pressing hard. So I had to. I was going to say, it's hard to, it's hard to share information when you're like. Hi, 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 hi. <laughs> Did you and feel uncomfortable? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I had to ask for permission. I said, yeah. I need to tell you something. I need to tell you the truth. I'm a medium. Oh, Yes, and I want to ask permission if I may bring a message from someone for you. And she said, okay. And so I was able to say, grandmother's here, and she's saying this and this and this and this and this. To bring the message. Um, That's like one of the, I think that's the only time that's ever (laughs) happened. How was that received? Um, Very well. It was important. I felt that there was exchange of energy because she did such a beautiful job in my mouth. (laughs) That's such funny timing. (laughs) I know. I felt like she should have said, could I bring you a message? You need to fly. (laughs) (laughs) That's awesome. We have an exchange here, you know. (laughs) So the universe's 
sweet spot is to find the pattern that repeats that supports health and wellness and excitement and joy and passion going forward in this life. Now, can I please talk to you about the Fibonacci sequence? Oh, please do. Yes. <laughs> Thank you for listening. Visit www.clairvoyaging.com for show notes, merch, or just to say hi. If you'd like to support our journey, visit www.buymeacoffee.com backslash clairvoyaging. This has been a production of Wayfeather Media.